Matt Miller, Paul Sweeney, live here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. We're streaming live on YouTube, so go over and check that out. A little roundtable here on some earnings. Dan Ives, Senior Equity Analyst at Wedbush Securities. He joins us live here uh, in his Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. I'm not sure if he's going to State College uh, this weekend. Not sure about that. Or are they, are they at yeah, Ohio State? Yeah, we'll be going to Columbus you're, Friday night. Oh, you're going to Columbus. Yeah. Oh, awesome. nice. Very I know, good. I got a bar for you. There, uh, <laughs> you go in there, order whatever you want, food and drink. If Penn State wins, they will pick up the tab. I'm going to hook you up. All right, Keith and Ranganathan, she's definitely not going to Columbus, Ohio, because uh, she's a professional. She covers the media sector for Bloomberg Intelligence, and we want to talk about Netflix and, and ESPN. Dan Knives, let's start with you. Tesla stock uh, not liking what they're hearing from Elon Musk. What was your takeaway from the quarter uh, for Tesla? Look, it was a disaster conference call. I mean, because it was the street wanted to hear about pricing, have the price cuts ended, what is the outlook like going forward? You know, instead, this was really must be more of an economist, you know, obviously much more somber. And I think investors leave with just more questions and answers in terms of this price war that, you know, we've talked about here a lot. You know, how long does it continue? And obviously on Cybertruck, that's going to be a huge vehicle relative to demand, but definitely going to be an uphill battle from a production perspective. So I, I got a million questions after that conference call. But my first one is on the Cybertruck. He uh, contends that this is like a special project and that makes it extra difficult to produce. Why is that? Why isn't it just a normal truck? I mean, this could be like an F-150 competitor. Um, it's so cool. Everybody wants it. So many people put in pre-orders. Why is it so hard to make? Yeah, from an engineering perspective, it's very difficult. So that's one, like, no one argues. Because about it's what, a special shape? Because of the shape, because of the materials in there, as well as what they're trying to do from a technology perspective. That's why... You talk about getting mass production. Hey, look, that's essentially why they built out Austin in terms mm -hmm. of Giga. But I do think must caution, of course, not the demand side, but the production. And to Matt's point, look, that's always been the issue with Tesla. It's about not about the demand story. It's about the production. Ironically, now, for the first time, demand sort of hit so equilibrium when it comes to supply. All right, so we've got uh, Tesla down about uh, eight nine percent. On the other side, we got Netflix up fifteen percent, monster quarter. Geetha, what did you hear on the conference call last night? What did investors hear on the conference call last night that got them all hot and lathered here for Netflix? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was a blockbuster quarter on all fronts, uh, Paul. So absolutely, the, the beat was it was not just a beat. It was the magnitude of the beat and the story. The narrative is really clean now. It's, it's getting much, much clearer, uh, you know, as far as the margin trajectory is concerned. They, they promised about 22, 23 percent margins going out in 2024. They promised, you know, subscriber momentum kind of extending into 2024. So really kind of firing on all cylinders, if you will. So, Geetha, it seems like, I mean, you follow the whole media space. It seems like Tesla's really pulling away from everybody else. You mean Netflix, right? Uh, net, 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 Netflix, thank you. Uh, the Netflix is just pulling away from all the competitors, maybe including Disney. Oh, absolutely. There's no doubt about it. We already know that Netflix is way ahead of its rivals, not only when it comes to subscriber scale, but also in terms of profitability. Remember, this is the only company that is generating profits today, Paul, on its streaming business. The rest of the space, this company is going to generate about seven, eight billion dollars in profits this year. The rest of the space, including Disney, Warner Brothers, you know, Paramount, all of them collectively will uh, throw out about eight to nine billion dollars in streaming losses. Um, so obviously, when it comes to profitability, when it comes to operating leverage, there is no doubt that Netflix is the clear winner. They are the dominant player. But what was the biggest surprise was the fact that they they're just throwing out tons of free cash flow. So this was, you know, a stock that we used to kind of almost mock and ridicule talking about, you know, you know, three and a half billion dollars in cash burn this year. They're putting out six and a half billion dollars of free That's cash flow. So this about. is, yeah, yeah, this is a free cash flow machine. And, and not just that, they committed to $10 billion in buyback. So as you kind of look, you know, at them shrinking that float, look at EPS growth. I mean, it's going to be in the 30% range for the next few years. And that is really huge in kind of this media landscape right now. I mean, I, I, my takeaway from our screen time conference last week was that uh, Netflix is the boss of everything. I mean, yeah. if I were uh, buying stocks, I would have loaded up 
after I saw, did you watch Harry Styles interviewing Ted Sarandos? I mean, Lucas Shaw interviewing Ted Sarandos <laughs> I did. last week. I thought it was, that guy came off like an absolute boss. They're doing everything right. They are. Look, and it, you know, I think the thing here, it's all not just about content. You think about the competition, what was coming from Disney. They've now taken a step back. And you look at that conference, well, that was a flex to muscles. Especially when you look at free cash flow. You, if you look at Netflix versus Tesla, just to take those yep. last night. It's not necessarily about the results. It's also, if you look at the communication, the street wants to understand what the path looks like in a very uncertain, cloudy market. Geetha, what's the headwind? What's the biggest risk for Ted and Flix? <laughs> right now, they seem to be getting everything right. So the one concern I think that kind of is still kind of lingering a little bit is this whole revenue growth reacceleration. I mean, they've got all the levers in place, but ARPU has been under pressure a little bit. We saw ARPU decline a little bit in the ARPU third quarter. ARPU is average revenue per user? Revenue per, you. Yes, yes, average revenue per user. Um, so that has become like the really big metric now to kind of gauge the success in the streaming world. They did, of course, caution to that. Um, they said it's going to be a little bit flat. But then again, we have price increases that are going into effect. We have the ad business that's going to take off. So as we kind of look to 2024, you know, everything is in place for that that metric to kind of ramp up pretty significantly as well. So right now they're getting everything right. Hey, Dan, my big question on EVs in general, and I just purchased a new vehicle. We're going back to Tesla now. We're going back to Tesla. It's kind of hard to keep track. Wait, what? That's why I'm these are two very different companies. I you know, know, but this very, they're both ripping stocks. People, these are the ones that are most well, red Tesla's all the getting time. killed today, right? Netflix yeah. is up 15%. Yep. Tesla is down 8.7. But for me, the big issue, having just purchased a new car, BMW X3. He loves the X3. Love the X3. Although I have like 12 miles on it. I'm just walking back and forth to the train every day. Um, is and demand. I, I really have questions about what is the real demand out there in America for EVs? Like I'm thinking beyond the rich, beyond like a second or third car. Like is right? there a political angle here? Like I think half the country will never buy an EV. Look, I mean, I, you're starting to get into a debate around what the demand curve looks like. But yeah. ultimately price is so important. If you look, go back to traditionally Tesla, 75, 80, 85,000. Now, even with the the, the tax credits, 35, 40,000, depending on what yeah. state you live in. But it does also, you talk about the battle from the Beltway and what's happening here, even with UAW and what's happening in Detroit with, with GM and Ford, it's all price driven. 3% of automobiles in the US are EVs today. So we believe that goes 10, 12%. There's gonna be massive winners, but it also comes down to price, especially in this macro. I mean, as long as, you know, President Biden is gonna pay me, He's basically, he's going to borrow money from my kids and my grandkids to pay me to buy an EV. Um, <laughs> I'm interested, but I want the Cybertruck. That's what, that's the one I want. Exactly. You know? and, Miller, a Miller, and Miller's going to have the Cybertruck while watching Netflix in full self-driving in three, <laughs> four years. Hey, Keith, another big day in the world of media yesterday was, or in the past couple of days, Disney for the first time ever released financial results for ESPN. And my takeaway was two things. One... Uh, their profit margins are, well, there's still a lot of cash flow, almost $3 billion of, of EBITDA, but it declined big time and it's nowhere near the number it used to be. What is ESPN, or what is Walt Disney Company going to do with ESPN? Yeah, that's the big, big question, Paul. And I mean, one of the reasons that they kind of broke this out as a standalone unit was because they really kind of wanted to show, you know, potentially future investors if they're planning to sell a stake or if they're planning to spin it off, you know, what the financials kind of look like. Um, but obviously, you know, the top line actually looks pretty stable at $16 billion. It, it's really the, the profit margins, as you rightly pointed out. I mean, you look at the traditional cable business, it's about 30, 35% margins. You look at ESPN's margins, it's 15% this year. So that is a little bit concerning. Concerning, and obviously it is only going to go lower given that, you know, sports rights fees are increasing astronomically. So they really need to do something with this asset. We know that they need to do it fast. The question is, do they sell it? Do they do they actually sell it to Apple as has kind of been said all uh, and, you know, or do they, you know, spin it out uh, again? We'll we'll have to wait and watch. I but like they I are definitely good. I kind of feel like I have to apologize to Keith because the 25 years I had covered in the media industry were the golden years. Everybody <laughs> made money. What I've left to Geetha is just a hodgepodge. I don't know what's going on out there, Geetha. What's the, I mean, can you get any investor out there to say, I want to overweight media? 
<laughs> no, not at all. Um, I mean, everything is down in the dumps right now, other than, of course, Netflix. Um, <laughs> but we'll have to wait and watch what happens with Disney. I think they have a great collection of assets. They're trying to do everything that they can, but Bob Iger obviously has a lot of challenges ahead of him. Including right. naming a successor, maybe. Ta- yeah, it seems like that um, is one of his worries, but others are just as pressing. I'll be interested to see if the leagues come in and get a piece of ESPN. Is that still on the table? Uh, Dan, what do you think? Uh, uh, could could like the NFL um, and some other professional sports leagues come in and take a big chunk of it? Look, we believe this is ultimately going to lead Apple to acquiring ESPN. Oh, you I think mean, Apple? It's all I mean, Apple. Our, our so does Laura Martin. Yeah. Our thesis has been, and Laura's talked about. Laura like, says all Disney. of Disney. No, so Laura talks about Disney, yep. which you know obviously makes sense there too. But we believe it's really about ESPN, the live streaming uh, asset. Okay. If you look at Apple with you know MLS and Messi, I think they recognize in terms of Cook and Cupertino, even though M&A is obviously not their sweet spot, ESPN's a unique asset. It'll be a better buy than Beats, right? And that was three and a half billion. How much is ESPN going to cost? I mean, we think 40 to 45 billion is probably what would be the price tag. Nice. But then when you look at Disney, you know, as this conversation is talking about some of the parts you sell. And that's why there's more and more pressure on Iger and the board. What's Disney worth? Like 150? Let me pull it up. Yes. Disney is currently in market cap terms worth 150. 3.7 3.7 billion. And we think about a third of that value. So if, if they get rid of, uh, if say they, let's say they get $50 billion for ESPN. Geetha, what is Disney then worth if they sell ESPN for $50 billion? That is actually a really, really high multiple. So, you know, if you kind of look where cable stocks are trading right now, they're trading at about seven and a half times EBITDA. At seven and a half times EBITDA, ESPN would be worth about anywhere from about 22 to 25 billion. So oh, it, it'll okay. be interesting. If, It'll be interesting if they can get that 15x multiple. That that would actually be awesome. But again, you have to kind of kind of look at, at at Disney's you know really bread and butter of the business. That is the parks business. That is going to you know just a few years ago, parks used to bring in only about 30 35 percent of operating income. This year, it's bringing in about 75 percent of operating Ooh. income at 10 billion dollars. Yep. So you know. Disney really is Parks right now, and yep, Parks itself should be worth, I think, two hundred billion. Nice. I want to. Uh, I just want Dan finally get back to Tesla in terms of production and the Gigafactory. Um, there was a lot of talk on the call yesterday about um, whether Musk could do a lot of his production in Texas. Um, where, where are they going to build the most of their, you know, expansion, or do, does their expansion not look? as fruitful as it did, you know, before this call. Expansion is going to be in Austin, broader mm-hmm. Texas, as well as in China. I mean, they're, they're focusing more and more away from California. Obviously, their course. And away from spot, Monterey. Away from Monterey. Yeah. And, and look, and fundamentally just speaks to mathematically, economically speaking, it's Texas. You talk about the Mexico plan that they're mm-hmm. going to, you know, ultimately start to build out. But it's really China. Capacity right now is not the issue. It's about the price cuts. Keep cutting prices. That's a bad spiral. Yep. All right. Dan Ives, uh, senior analyst at Wedbush Securities, covering all that fun stuff in tech. And Geetha Ranganathan, uh, she is the media analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence based down in Princeton. And Dan, heading off to Columbus, Ohio, to see undefeated the Penn great State, State of Ohio take on undefeated the Ohio State University. Ohio State. Huge. 